Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Several weeks ago, when I first looked at this gospel lesson and began to sketch out my thoughts and what this sermon might be about, it was completely different than the events of this week have taken the sermon and the direction that I'm going to talk to you about this morning. I'm sure by now most of you heard the tragic story this week of little Andrew McMorris, the Boy Scout, who was killed by the drunk driver. Well, back on May 28, 2006, I had the privilege and the honor of baptizing little Andrew into the Christian faith, into the extended arms of the Savior. Not only did I have that privilege, but Andrew and his family have been a part of my life for 25 years. Their family really sums up the total of my ministry as a pastor. It began when my moving truck pulled up to our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Aqualog out in Riverhead for my pastoral internship, my vicarage. Finally, after all those years of study, I was finally going to be able to do those practical things to become a pastor and learn how to be a pastor. And wouldn't you know it, the youth group came to meet us and to start unloading the truck. And there were these two twin junior high boys, Chris and Kirk. I'll never forget the moment. I'll never forget the kids. And they helped us unpack the truck. Chris and Kirk were Andrew's uncles. This started a relationship that has lasted right up until this day. Chris went on to become my youth director when I was at St. John's in Sayville. Kirk went on to become a pastor. I traveled the country for various weddings that involved their rather large family. I married Andrew's parents. I baptized Andrew. And on countless occasions, I sat in hospital rooms as this family went through some very difficult and challenging times. But 10 years ago, when I went through my divorce, there became a little distancing between our families because that was challenging for all of us and them as I was their pastor and their friend. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. But in what I like to call one of those divine coincidences, which never really is a coincidence because it's usually God working with little small things because God sees bigger things on the horizon. Over the last year or so, my connection with the family has grown stronger and stronger again for a variety of different reasons. So I've been immersed this past week with this family in the midst of this tragedy that you all read about and heard about on the news. So you may be sitting there and asking yourself, so what does that have to do with today's gospel lesson and our time together in church? Well, frankly, it has everything to do with it. The Gospel lesson is one of the most challenging readings we can ever hear from Jesus, right? I know every time this comes up on the church's lectionary and I see it coming, I start to sweat. Because like most of us here, I've been touched by divorce also, right? And this is a real tricky 
gospel lesson because for many of us, it is such a personal thing. In one way or the other, just about every one of us here have been touched by divorce. Either we've been through divorce or we have somebody in our family who's been divorced and it's affected us in one way or the other. And if a pastor is not careful parsing the words of Jesus in this gospel lesson, it's easy for people to get hurt and offended when this gospel lesson comes up in the church's calendar, the church's lectionary. And that's frankly where I thought this sermon was going to go when I originally started sketching it out several weeks ago. Now we have to keep in mind that any time Jesus singles out something or a sin in Scripture, it's not intended to be some sort of personal attack on any of us. What Jesus is always doing when he does these things is focusing on the fact that sin breaks apart, destroys lives, and causes great pain. And when Jesus does that, he does it with the intention always of not leaving us hanging in the pain, but turning us back to the healing power that his life, his death, and his resurrection is all about. So that's how we have to hear these words. Words that began, if you remember from the text, when the Pharisees came to challenge Jesus, they weren't really there to learn more about marriage and divorce. The Pharisees were there once again to try to trip up Jesus on some sort of legal technicality. Jesus knows their intentions in their heart are not pure. He also knows that they're doing this deceitfully and they're losing sight of the real problem with divorce that it causes so much pain and so much hurt and so much brokenness in people's lives. So Jesus isn't willing to play their game. He wants to get it back to the point that he wants to make with the people, which we hear emphasized even more heavily when he goes back in private with the apostles and they question him on divorce, and he ups the ante. He throws that word out there that makes all of us cringe, adultery. But he doesn't do that to make it more painful. He does it to put divorce in the proper place. Adultery is one of the Ten Commandments, right? So what Jesus is basically saying is that just like when the other nine commandments are broken, when this happens in our marriages, it does reflect the power of sin, the hurt and the pain and the division that's brought by it. And any time Jesus points us to the commandments and shows us our sin. It's for the sole purpose of leading us to the healing, extended arms that he has reached out on the cross with us for and reaches into our lives through the gifts of the church to bring us that healing and to bring us that power. Ten years ago, when I got divorced as their pastor, it affected the McMorris family. It didn't just affect my family. It affected the family of faith, God's family. And for that, the healing power of Jesus' extended arms was needed. Any time, any sin occurs in our life, whatever the label may be, take any one of the Ten Commandments from one to ten. We have a problem because we like to categorize, categorize some as far worse than others, when in reality, any one of the ten breaks and hurts and destroys human life. But whatever the label may be, whatever the sin may be, when we see it and it happens, God wants to provide healing and forgiveness and hope for us. So when there's a divorce, there's a need for healing. When a man commits a really stupid mistake, like the one last Sunday that affected the life of the McMorris family, the other Boy Scouts, and not only them, but so many other lives, including his own family. And I'm sure if that man could go back in time and change the circumstances, he would. But that's not the reality of the situation. So that family's been destroyed too. Whatever the sin may be, Whatever the brokenness may be, God wants us to know that he's here to heal us. That's why I believe very strongly that it is intentional that Jesus follows up these strong, hard words to heal on marriage and divorce 
by talking about welcoming the little children. That's the ultimate point, to remind us that we are all God's little children and that nothing should stand in the way of God embracing all of us as his children, especially when we are hurt and in need of healing. And especially when there's divorce, children, God's children need healing. Whenever there is sin, God's children need healing. As I was going through the emotions and the challenges of this past week and all the things that were tied with it, I, I decided I was going to go try to see if, if I could find the liturgy where I baptized Andrew. I found it. And when I found it, I was shocked at what I found. Because as Andrew's parents and his godparents were bringing little baby Andrew 12 years ago up to the baptismal font to be received into the extended arms of the Savior, the congregation was all singing an incredible hymn. Now, if you've read the articles and you've heard anything about Andrew, this is a kid who wanted to be a pilot and even got his junior pilot's license. He had his life all planned out to be a pilot. Well, the hymn the congregation was singing was Jesus, Savior, Pilot, me. I got chills. Another one of those divine coincidences, which isn't really a coincidence at all. Because in the big picture of things, though God doesn't cause the tragedies that come in our lives, God certainly sees the path that lays before us. And that Him was an incredible promise to Andrew, to his family, and to all of us as we go through life. Now what's interesting, remember, back 150 years ago when this hymn was written, men didn't fly. So when they talked about piloting, it was the sea. But I imagine if it had been written after, what, 1902, or whenever the Wright brothers did what they did, the words might be a little different. But think about these words, and think about it the power of God's grace and baptism to Andrew and to all of us. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Over life's tempestuous sea, unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass come from thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. 